What if you could hang out in an epic location with an awesome, like-minded practitioner tribe, having extraordinary experiences with a community of leaders, innovators, and visionaries, all sharing their wisdom to move our profession forward? It all starts with the Naturpreneur Experience, a professional development conference like no other for naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists, and practitioners. Check out NatX2019 at TammyGuest.com for more details. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line again today is Rachel Arthur. Rachel has had wonderful teachers and mentors over the past 20 years, more now, including the esteemed Dr. Tini Gruner. Each of Rachel's past and present mentors have fed her passion for critical thinking and independent education in naturopathy, making it a major focus in Rachel's ongoing career. She contributed a decade of teaching naturopathy across SSNT, Endeavour, Monash University, Victoria University, and lastly, Southern Cross University, where she met Tini. Being a key speaker at the major integrative medical conferences or co-founding the extraordinary and vital Australian Naturopathic Summit, Rachel sees every platform as an opportunity to improve the knowledge base of the naturopathic and integrated professional community, as well as raise the standard of our profession by virtue of, hopefully, she says, being a worthy ambassador. And I said it before, she certainly is that. Welcome back, Rachel, to FX Medicine. Thanks so much, Andrew. Great to be here. Now, you've had some great mentors in your past, and today we are speaking about the critical importance of a mentor in your career. So, Let's start right from that. How important is it to have a mentor in fostering clinical excellence? Uh, look, I, I think it can't be overstated, really. I think, you know, none of us are functioning at our best if we're operating as silos, you know, as we're, as if we're out on our own, we don't have people to bounce ideas off, we don't have people to question or challenge us, introduce us to new concepts. And I think that even though we get some of those prompts for growth from, you know, CPE and, and different things like that, I think that mentoring is on a whole different level where it's collegiate. You know, you, you're talking to a colleague. You're, you're able to table something that is, you know, full of the detail of what you've just been exposed to in, in, in your clinic setting with your patients and things like that. And I think that, you know, the value in that, you know, is exponentially greater than, than most other forms of, of ongoing education because there's, there's this very sort of tailored knowledge growth and, and skill development, but there's other, there's kind of deeper levels to it. It's this sense of support and collegiality. And one of the big things that I'm, you know, increasingly kind of talking about, which is collaboration, not competition. Yes. A very important word you said there twice was collegiate. And yeah. it, 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 to me, it, it really rings about mentorship. There's this image that, con that mentor, um, having a mentor conjures up about one-on-one. -on -one. Is it that or do yeah. you tend to work more in a group? I work more in groups. And I think that um, I'm, I think I think there's two parts to that, Andrew. It's so important. I love that word collegiality and that mm. notion. And I think I think you know one important story to that is, you know, I have obviously a large uh, number of groups that are run every year, and we have a very large number of um, practitioners that we're privileged to. I'm privileged to mentor as part of that group, and of as part of those groups. And you know, a lot of them are reasonably new graduates. As you know, a lot of them aren't. A lot of them have been in practice for decades, but we do have a fair proportion of new graduates. Um, and I guess one of the things that excites me is how quickly they become my colleagues. So I think that they start off, you know, in that student-teacher model. You know, I'm talking, they're listening. You know, and I'm saying, well, it's like this. And, you know, I'm doing a lot of hand-holding to begin with. 
But what happens is this accelerated blossoming, really, and growth where very quickly, you know, even within the space of a year of our mentorship program, I'm looking across at them, not down at them. I'm looking across at them and going, well, what do you think? You know, well, what, what, yeah. what, you know tell, tell me a little bit about your experience in this area or with this particular thing. And, and you know, so it's not that kind of traditional hierarchical model of, of the learning structure. They do become like peers. And, you know, certainly I've had um, mentees who are in perhaps their third year or something like that of my program. You know, I, I would refer to them in a heartbeat, and I do. You know, I'm constantly in a very f- fortunate position where, I, you know, we get so many patient inquiries and I'm able to say, here's my long list, you know, of people that I can absolutely vouch for um, because they're my colleagues. Yes, I'm still in the role of mentor. Um, and I feel very lucky at times to to hold that role with so many knowledgeable people. But, um, you know, it's, it's not that kind of, um, you know, top-down sort of model. We're very much trying to um, bring everybody up to the same level. Yeah. He, the other thing I would say, sorry, Andrew, just about that is, is you know, and, and this kind of came up recently where we were talking about is, is learning linear, you know, is it is kind of, you know, it goes in one direction. I'm teaching, you know, so my groups are made up, you know, each group has about a dozen practitioners and we try to get practitioners together of a similar sort of clinical experience level um, and uh, and mentoring exposure. And so, you know, is it that I'm teaching them? Is it this one directional sort of path of, of the handing over knowledge? And I always say, no way, absolutely not. You know, the the every time there's there's learning coming back to me as well, where I think, oh, that's really interesting because you know of the sharing and again yeah. that collaboration and that collegiality that's going on. You know, there's this you know um, you know learning that that is is nonlinear. It goes in every direction. I think it's really interesting that we tend to sort of think, why should we need it, but we have to take a step back here. If you think about our orthodox peers, you know, let's say um, doctors, they indeed are encouraged to discuss difficult cases with A, their peers, B, their immediate superiors, or C, a specialist in that area. They are indeed mm. encouraged to learn more. That is not a one-off. It is throughout their whole career because there mm. will undoubtedly crop up difficult cases that confound normal treatment paradigms in whatever aspect you're looking to treat them, whether it be orthodox or complementary, integrated. Mm. Um, so I, I just think it's th- there's this real mindset that needs to change about I need to be enough. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that often comes from a fear place. I think that yes. the, the um, feeling that I have gaps or I lack experience in certain areas conjures up um, you know, some fear for all of us. Um, but, um, you know, to to have the the goal or the illusion, I would say, that, that you could be everything and not need uh, guidance and mentoring and input from other people, I think is really a false goal. And, I, you know, I think that, and you and I have touched on this before, I worry for the practitioners that... Um, don't do CPE really anymore or, you know, uh, don't don't engage in mentoring and say, no, no, I, I know what I know now and I'm happy with that. I think, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's sad. That's, that's a little bit um, stifling, you know, because there's just so much room for, for growth. So, yeah, I think, I think it is, you know, it, it's just a fantastic opportunity and like you say, it's not unique to naturopaths. It, it's actually a strength that yeah. health professionals show across the different kind of um, modalities is that idea that someone, there's always somebody who's got experience in a different area. That's right. You know, we, we, we had a situation recently. I mean, we're in the groups, we're always, we have rotating presenters. So that means every practitioner gets an opportunity to present their case. So for a lot of the time, you're listening to other people's cases. And in the beginning, when I put out this model, I thought, gosh, is this really going to fly? You know, am I going to have people who go, 
whole year and I only got to present one case. And oh, no. we never found that to be true. And one of the things that came back was, um, and we've heard this so many times now, is people saying, oh, it's just brilliant because the exposure to cases, conditions, people, situations that I hadn't personally seen myself, but inevitably I was going to see at some point. And then here's this fabulous safe space to get this kind of, you know, exposure first and to have to develop some literacy in this area. We just had one of our mentees contact us recently and say, you know, um, someone walked into her practice this month with POTS. And she said, I'd never even heard about POTS until the month before when in our group we had done a POTS patient. And she was like, oh, Not exactly common. (laughs) That's right. And she was like, oh, thank goodness. I, you know, I'm not having to pull a poker face here. I've, you know, I've been, I've had a bit of a a reconnaissance around this condition and and that sort of thing. So I think that, um, you know, just, that even at that level saying, you know, my experience won't be absolute and isn't it great to tap into other people's experiences and exposures and conditions mm. so that when they do come into my clinic, you know, I don't hyperventilate. I go, oh, that's okay. I've, I've had some introduction to this. How does a naturopath or herbalist or nutritionist choose an appropriate mentor though? Oh, I think that's such a good question. Um For me, I I guess, first of all, I should speak from my own personal experience. For me, I've chosen mentors based on specific identified needs within myself. So, you know, I would think, oh, I feel not so confident in this area, you know, whatever it was. So for me, um, uh, last year in particular, this was around heavy metals, and I thought, you know, I've always been interested and I've always danced around the edges, but, you know, maybe I, I really need to upskill in this area. Um, so so that's one way of going about choosing um, a mentor is you can say, well, I'm looking for this particular um, strength, this particular skill set. You know, so a lot of people come to me because they're looking to develop their pathology interpretation. That's something that they really want to include in their practice model and and they need that that mentoring to, to get up to that level. So for me, I, I sometimes I go, oh, here's a need that I recognize in myself. Who then can I go out and, and really um, say is, is the expert in that area that, that offers mentoring? I think the other thing for me is I actually have um, personally a number of my mentors and, and some of you know our, your listeners will know this, some of my mentors are not naturopaths and I find that very helpful as well. Um, so I have a couple of doctors that are my mentors and mm. I'm so, so grateful for that. Mm. And that's just because they their mind when it comes to pathology, pathophysiology is the kind of... Um, labyrinth that I enjoy so much and, and I can go and and really bounce very complex ideas off them and you know they 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 have so much to offer in that way hmm. so sometimes it's interesting to also go outside of of our own modality you know I also have one mentor who's a psychologist and that's obviously because I work a lot in mental health so again that's a specific need where I say well sometimes you know this is the the bolt that needs tightening for me I need to just keep making sure I'm I'm um, always bettering myself in this way but I think one of the things that comes up probably most strongly as that kind of um how to make a decision or how to choose a mentor is feeling that the way that this person practices res- resonates very deeply with you. Yeah. And I know that you've had a chat to um, Anna Sangster um, and the listeners are going to hear her perspective about um, mentoring with me. But that was that's one of the things she talks about is, you know, she had thought there, there's we that we shared a lot in common. You know, she liked the evidence-based approach. She liked the uh, the pathology reading. She liked, you know, those sort of things. So, you know, if you like, you know, energetic sort of practice or more counselling-based practice, then you should look for those sort of, um, you know, uh, mentors who who practice that way. If if that's where you you want your guidance. Um, so yeah, I think I think feeling really a strong you know, shared 
I guess, practice model is good. That's not to say that stretching yourself is a bad idea. I have a lot of people who come to me and go, I've got the dietary therapy. I've got the energetic stuff. I'm really, I'm cool with that. Um, What I want is, you know, how to read blood tests. What I want is the scientific base, and and that's why I'm coming to you. So I think there's all different sorts of ways to choose mentors, but um, but you know, I, th- I think finding somebody and and dipping your toe in the water and having one session with someone, you know, it's a bit like that's what I say to patients about finding the right psychologist. I say, well, you know, if you hate them after the first session, they're the wrong person. You know, you, you need to have that session to see if you feel like this is someone who speaks a language that you can really engage with and that, you know, they've got a lot to offer you. I remember Dr. John Lee years ago told me that which you feel you are deficient in is what you need to do. Um, yes. <laughs> can I ask you, though, what should a clinician be asking themselves about to bring to the table to a mentor? Where do they start? Where do they begin this help? I, you know, oh, I want to learn. I want to branch question. out. I want to improve. Yeah. Look, I think that's a good question. Look, I, you know, I do think that that mentoring, even in an informal way, even if it's just an informal professional support network that you have where you can bounce cases off, you know, a local group of Nats or something like that, I think it's non-negotiable, to to be perfectly honest. I think it's non-negotiable because if we don't do that, you know, and this comes back to your question about who, who, you know, how do we ask ourselves that question about who needs mentoring? You know, if we don't do that, then we have to ask ourselves, where is our knowledge coming from? And just like doctors, overwhelmingly our knowledge is coming from commercial sources. And while they can be incredibly valuable and help us to, you know, succinctly cut to the chase with research developments and things like that, we we know that this is passing through a filter mm. and that it has a very clear end point in mind, which is, you know, oh, lo and behold, we have a product that goes with this. You know, so I think that, um, you know, anybody who can't identify non-commercial sources of education um, that they're exposed to on a regular basis, that's you. That, that's your litmus test there. Yeah. If you're going, alarm oh, bells. And I really only go to yeah. I really only go to a few company seminars, and you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I think you know when I read technical things that come out, and you know, that, that that's that's your that's your proof right there that you need in some sort of capacity to be immersed in, um, you know non-commercial sources of education, non-commercial sort of driven source of education. And as I said, that could be as easy as an informal, you know, network of you and your besties who are also naturopaths, um, or it could take the formal, you know, kind of form of, of professional mentoring as well. Yeah. I, th- I think it, it, like it's plainly obvious what's happened in the medical profession. To, to think that the integrative profession is any different in Mm. Um, being beguiled by commercial interests is, Mm. um, you know, let's say rather amateurish. Um, Mm. You know, um, one must always be aware and question and question again, um, Mm. am I doing the right thing for my patients? I have to ask you, though, from your perspective, and just to go back a little bit, your relationship, and it was a very close relationship um, with Tini Gruner, Mm. how did that start? And what was it that, that attracted you to be mentored by Tini? And and because I I get the feeling that that really awoke something in your professional career. Look, it really did, and it was funny because Tini wasn't you know my my first mentor, and um, Tini was really, uh, you know, she she was actually my my um, thesis supervisor. Yeah. So she she was paid to look after me, Andrew. Let's face it, <laughs> and um, and um, she when I think what struck me about Tini was a couple of things. One was um her overwhelming generosity of knowledge and that was r- really hit you in the face when you met Tini and I know I, I still have contact of course with a lot of her um, students and you know we all feel very similarly um or, or certainly the people I talk to feel very similarly about that um and I, I think you do want you know when we're talking about how to choose a mentor choose a generous one 
would be the other thing I would say. Yeah. You know, let's not get people who charge by the minute and don't give you a second more and, you know, like Come isn't on. it about yeah. sharing, you know, sharing mm. for the betterment of our whole profession? That's, that's what I think. So, you know, I've learned from some of the best. Um, Leslie Braun, I would have mentioned, was uh, very unofficially my mentor years and years ago when we worked, worked on the book Braun and Cohen together. Yeah. Her generosity smacked you in the face. Yeah. She was amazing. Uh, Talk about amazing. an encyclopedia on her on her own. She's incredible. That's right. Yeah. And then when I met Tini, I felt like I'd felt uh, I'd felt I'd met another one who was very similar in that way. Just incredible knowledge. Um, always questioning herself. Um, always uh, open to challenge. Um, and and just wanted to share it all with me, you know. Um, so I was in there as a as a thesis student. I think this the second thing that really um was game changing with Teeny was that up until that point, I'd always I dabbled with pathology testing. Mm. So I, when I worked in practice in Melbourne, I was already ordering. Um, so it was a bit kind of radical because that's a long time ago, but I was already ordering the occasional blood test myself yep. um, and and looking at them. But really, you know, a bit like a Labrador sort of tilting the head on the side going, I'm fascinated by these, but I'm not sure I entirely understand them. Um, and then when I met Tini, it, it was like meeting my own kind. Of course, she was so passionate about using blood tests and and uh, interpreting them from a naturopathic perspective and really um, understanding what I call making the the invisible visible in our patients in terms of what's really going on and I just went oh my gosh um, you, you were the person I've been you know kind of unknowingly looking for so you know it was a combination of her incredible generosity and that that deep resonance with I loved her model. Her model was the model that I was sort of starting to build myself, but she gave me this giant, you know, hand up to kind of the top of the summit sort of feeling. Yeah. So yeah, that that was absolutely um, a real game changer meeting Teeny and working the, with her. Now, as you mentioned just before, uh, we spoke yesterday with Anna Sangster, who's a Western Australian-based naturopath, uh, a mentee. I love that name that you give them, a mentee. Um, a mentee, yes, a mentee <laughs> I give them. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let's just have a listen to uh, the chat that I had with her uh, yesterday, and then you and I will come back and discuss a little bit about what she said. Let's have a listen now. Anna, firstly, can you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Sure. So I studied naturopathy at the old Nature Care College and I was really fortunate because in my second year I got a job working at Holistic Healthcare. So right from the get-go I actually was being mentored um, by a naturopath called Christine Wiltshire and I worked with her for four years. And then I also did the um, the work under Francesca Nash as doing the, um, what did she call it, the advanced, I think, diploma of natural fertility management. And then when I had been graduated for a year, I was lucky enough to be invited to work at the Jocelyn Centre with Francesca. Oh, wow. So I know, it's very fortunate. So I actually worked with Francesca and um, did, she did a lot of work with mentoring with me, which was fantastic, and also with Dr. Susan Lorenz, who was there at the time. Yeah. So I was very fortunate. And um, I stayed with them for a while and then... I was pregnant myself, so I moved to City Beach in Perth and set up my own clinic after my son was born. So you've been mentored all throughout your your education. I have. This? I was incredibly lucky. The, the incredibly first, um, lucky. I know the first lady. I have to say she was amazing, Christine Wiltshire. But um, I was paid um, quite a low rate, and the trade off was that I got to sit in with all her cases. And then I would have to write notes on all her cases and then she would sort of drill me and train me and, and teach me everything about the case so that um, as soon as I graduated, I walked straight into a job with her. So it was in incredible. Wow. Well, I want to mm. ask you a little bit about be how being mentored affects the way you practice. I want to ask that a little bit later. But first, I want to ask you about, you're going to be a little bit different, I can see, but how did you feel about your preparedness upon first completing your bachelor degree? Well, like I said, I was so incredibly lucky because um, I know that pretty much everybody I graduated with 
they were all very nervous and, and no one had a job and it was all very scary. But I was so fortunate in that I actually got really ready and I'd been sitting in watching and observing for three years. And so I just was chanting at the bit to get out there and do it. What about your colleagues? How were they feeling about their preparedness? Um, I think I think pretty much everybody was quite nervous and um, the, the ones that had sort of worked in clinics, you know, they had more experience and I think they were um, eager. But we're, I think most people are pretty nervous when you first leave college and you feel very green, which is a shame because, there's, you know, the... I don't. I don't think. I think the clinic programs are fantastic that are run in the um, in the student clinics. But I do think when you step out into the real world, it is. It can be a real shock. Real daunting, yeah. Mm. So I understand you've been mentored by Rachel Arthur. How has the mentorship program affected the way that you practice? Well, it's been great actually. So I, um, at the beginning, I think last year, I decided that. I just wanted to keep learning, so I um, was looking around to see who was who practiced or, or taught in a style that I really enjoyed. And I'd heard Rachel lecture a few times, and she's very down to earth and quite funny, and um, really science and evidence based, which is what I was looking yeah. for. So I contacted her and um, decided that I would rather do a one on one mentorship mentorship with her. So every fortnight we have an hour together and it's been fantastic. It's been really, really useful, particularly for interpretation of different pathology results. So um, I'm very fortunate that I work with a doctor and so I have um, a doctor that I can run results by. But seeing them from a more naturopathic perspective and looking more at optimal you know, ranges that we want someone to yeah. be in rather than the great big broad Australian parameters. And the cut <laughs> <laughs> it's been fantastic in that respect with Rachel. Okay, so I've got to ask you that sort of question. Have you found a marked difference between the may the way that a medico will look at pathology towards the uh, compared to the way that a naturopath would look at pathology results? It's completely different. So, um, and I, and this is one thing that I try really hard to explain to the uh, my colleagues and you know the people that I work with in my clinic and also to the students that observe in our clinic and also when we're talking to our, the GP with us. Is saying, no, this, this person does fit in this enormous big broad parameter, but they're not well. Mm. And so I guess the difference is fundamentally we're trying to bring someone up and make them well as opposed to ensuring that they stay within this broad parameter. So th when, we talk, when I talk with Rachel, it's more about you know, refining the parameters and working out where someone's going to sit with optimal health rather than you know, n not just in this gigantic range, which is what is always... Um, Showing on all the path labs. Do you find that the the naturopathic aspects of nurturing, of nourishing a body, um, has helped your patients or has seen your patients' results come back into the mid range of normal rather than the lower range of that cut off sort of thing? Yes, absolutely. So I think because you know fundamentally the first thing we reach for is the diet and lifestyle. So I think even sometimes without doing anything at all, with no prescribing, just fundamentally looking and, and helping educate a patient around their diet and around their lifestyle factors that may be influencing their results, you can see such a giant pathology shift. And, you know, that's represented by the patient suddenly having this wonderful sense of wellness and, and the lifting of their symptoms. So I think, you know, our approach, that naturopathic approach is, is so beneficial for, you know, those, those, those small changes make a really big difference. Have you found with the various mentors that you've had that discussing the patient case history be either before or after or both um, has really resulted in, in a sort of greater mind shift about opportunities for intervention that you might have? So, well, the normal way that, the way that I work, so I have um, a lovely group as well that we work together in our, in our sort of case discussions. And so what we do is we take, you know, every, each cracky takes their own case and then we discuss them and it is, it's been fantastic to work. So I work with, you know, sort of five people and we do our case discussion. Sometimes we will say, well, look, you know, let's throw this one at Rachel and see what she comes up with. Yeah. And then we discuss it as a group. And it just really helps. Particularly, We've got a couple of young um, new grads who've joined us. And it just gives them that lovely confidence to go, right, I now know what to do when, uh -huh. I, you know, when I next approach the patient. So can I ask you, are there any specific cases where you've been mentored that has resulted in better outcomes for your patients, measurably better outcomes? We've had some really, um, I think after you've been in practice for a while, you get thrown some really curly ones. Mm. So um, I had a, a really interesting case where um, a young boy had vitiligo and then it turned out his dad, who was also in the room, got severe vitiligo at the same time. And it was very marked and it sort of began at... Um, 
straight away at the same time. And sadly, they were sort of just left alone, ignored by the medical profession as bad luck. But it's incredibly uncommon when two people mm. in a family start with vitiligo pretty much at the same week. And so I was talking to Rachel about that, and we just sort of were talking about who, you know, how's the best way to approach this. And um, I was really interested in the environmental aspect. So what sort of environmental exposure had these people had to have this trigger, this condition? And um, it was great talking to Rachel because she helped. We we found actually um, someone who's very into environmental medicine to get involved and engaged in the case with. So yeah, it was really helpful because I think a big part of what what is beneficial is knowing who's the right person to refer on to in the case as much as anything. Now you've been both a mentee and a mentor to a group. Um, tell me about the shift in that, the responsibility. And also, what's been your experience with seeing the the mentees come up with your group? Well, I think it is a really big responsibility, and that's um, I think it's so important to stay on top of your game and to keep your knowledge as current as possible. Which I think is one of the things that motivated me to find Rachel, because I do have a group of five that I work with, and I wanted to make sure that you know I was keeping my knowledge as current as possible. I am. Um, I, I, we have some students, and interestingly, my sister's actually just qualifying as a naturopath as well. And so it's, I just think, you know, these, these people that are about to qualify and anyone that's, you know, actively practicing, I think it's so important to find a mentor and to, you know, actively engage and keep your knowledge current because just, you know, just going to seminars run by, you know, companies is not enough. No. I think it's so important to to have someone that you can bounce your case ideas with and find direction with. You know, we've, we've spoken about coming out of college and, and the beginning years. What about somebody who's already established in practice? Would you recommend mentorship for them? I would. I think there's two things that I would recommend. Um, I think there is some amazing, there's some absolutely amazing master's degrees that are out there in, in reproductive medicine and nutrition, and I think staying current in that field is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is nothing more important than finding a mentor and you know, to, to continue the learning because there's, it's it's very hard with constant, you know, all the scientific studies coming out and all the, the new information. It's hard to stay on top of it unless you are, you know, getting that information distilled and, you know, and actively pursuing it. I think it's really hard to stay on top of the aim. So I think it's essential. Anna Sangster, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Well, that was Anna Sangster, an obviously confident and relaxed nature about her, obviously expert now in her practice, and yet she still favours mentorship for her. And I think this is mm. brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's really exciting, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've I mean, I, I think that the people who continue to want to challenge themselves are often the people who become the biggest forces to reckon with, really. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do you know what I mean? I think, absolutely. I think so. And I think, I think you know, when um, we just, the we ran our internship program over um, the summer this year where we took on uh, nine interns and we were talking about all sorts of things, literature reviews and research writing and technical skills and things like that. But one of the things I really kept saying to them was, um, you have to come out of your individual houses and realise that the way to fully realise your potential is through collaboration. Yeah. And the more you keep your door closed and the more you kind of keep your hand over your own work, the less you'll grow. Yeah. And and I, th I think that's true for clinicians as well. I really do. And and Anna's an amazing example. You know, I learned from listening to that recording. I was like, oh, I didn't actually know every bit about Anna's background. Um but it doesn't surprise me because she is an extraordinary clinician Absolutely. now. It doesn't surprise me that she's she's had, you know, fantastic mentoring all the way along. Mm. You know, just to, to take it out of the integrative medicine aspect or even medicine, you could be a financial advisor and you re would require a mentor. You could be a chef and you would require a mentor. You see programs on TV now about business people having problems with their hair salon and bringing in a mentor. And I think that's such so important in an ongoing career of whatever your chosen career is. So I've got yeah. to ask you though, Rachel, when you're sitting down with your group, what topics do you discuss in your mentorship program? How do you decide on them? There's so many to choose from. 
Well, the, the topics choose themselves because what happens is all our mentor groups um, uh, up until this point, so they've been running for about, I think it's almost seven years now, which is, uh, sorry, six years, six or years. Yeah, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. But all the, all the groups um, work where one practitioner presents a case every month. So I don't direct the choice of those cases. Um, the the selection seems to organically sort of uh, work well. Um, and but what it means is, you know, we are – it's not an artificial agenda. I'm not coming in saying this week, let's, <laughs> let's talk about the cut. Um, what's <laughs> happening instead is someone's coming in going – oh, my goodness, I've got a Crohn's patient and uh, all the immunosuppressants aren't working and, you know, uh, they're on the heaviest level of medication. What do I do now? Yep. You know? Yep. Um, and and then the next week, you know, it will be a thyroid case and the next week will be a paediatric neurobehavioural case and it really goes anywhere and everywhere. Um, there are only a couple of areas where um, – uh, that are what we call out of bounds. So out of bounds for our group uh, cases are cancer and fertility. And again, when you're talking about how to choose a mentor, make sure they have limitations, you know, and, and they're my limitations. I always say, look, cancer and fertility, there are much better mentors out there for you if that's what you want help with. Um, but uh, so we, we don't do cases in those areas. So really the... the um, the content is incredibly broad too because if I stood up there and said, okay, this week we're going to do gut, um, it doesn't – well, immediately it's not real because gut doesn't come as gut, you know. The patient who presents with gut problems – presents with a multitude of other issues going on yeah. and maybe even they didn't realise that gut was one of them. You know, so it's always about um, dealing with real cases um, and talking about real solutions. What is this person going to do after the group session is finished? We don't drop the case there. There's a lot of follow-on where we keep discussing it. We have a very particular platform we use online. We keep discussing it. We keep um, uploading new results for that patient. You know, the conversation keeps going, but I need to know at the end of that case discussion that that practitioner has a plan. They have a very clear plan about what they're going to do when that patient comes in at the next appointment, either in terms of more questioning, further assessments, uh, changing treatment, you know, um, all of those sorts of things. So it keeps it real, Andrew, and it's always that. I, I, I think that's the real beauty and that's kind of what I realised I didn't mention before when we were talking about why mentoring, why is it so powerful and more powerful than a lot of the other education platforms is because it's applied. It's, yeah. it's not a theoretical. It's not abstract. It's not can, how can I impress you with my biochemical cycles? You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, oh, gosh, you know. Um, that sounds like a really complex case from an emotional aspect, mm. from a physical aspect. Oh, yep, there's some genetic things in there as well. How do we sew it all together and make a plan? And, you know, one of the things that um, that, that has come back in the feedback just in this last month from, mentor, from a lot of the mentees was that they're saying that, and these are particularly the newbies, so they're new to my mentoring program this year and they're yeah. reasonably new to practice is they say that going through these cases every month equips them to sift through and go beyond the overwhelm because people's health is overwhelming. The complexity of what we see is often overwhelming. But by talking them through the case, and using the kind of models that um, and systems that I use, so mind maps and timelines and things like that, you know, they go, oh, at the end of the case, I, I could do something. I, it's not out of my, um, you know, knowledge level or whatever. Now I can see where I need to start. And so, you know, it's just helping people to always bring it back to sometimes you know, just where to start and, and you know, how am I going to help these people without getting into, you know, incredibly complex medicine far too early. I love what you said about the responsible recognition of limitations. We all have them. We all can't know everything. There is somebody mm. else who has an expertise in this area. And indeed, I've seen you 
um, question and go, hang on, I need to look at this aspect further. Mm. I, I remember you were talking about um, cryptopyrols or, or MoFact, whatever mm. you want to call it. And so you actually sought out this chemist who was mm. indeed the, the person that brought that test to Australia. Mm. So That's right. Yeah, and I, I'll always remember you doing that and saying, okay, well, I have a deficit. I know I have a deficit. Let's recognise it and let's a- address that. Rachel, Arthur, thank you so much for taking us through your, I mean, it is obvious and it it is extensive, your expertise, not just in clinical practice, but in also sharing that with other clinicians. But I'd also like to thank Anna Sangster for, again, um, sharing her journey, which has obviously resulted in a confident um, expert practitioner. And um, now she's sharing her value um, amongst practitioners over in Western Australia. Thank you to both. Thank you, Andrew. It's been an absolute pleasure. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you can find more Industry Insights podcasts and resources under the Community tab on the FX Medicine website.